And let's pray together before we take up the Lord's word this morning. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. That you would hear our prayers because of the Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator and great high priest, who intercedes for us. We bring up to you Clive and his fight for cancer. We ask that grace and mercy will be given to him to cope with all the treatment uh, in the following weeks to come. We also think of Joel and we pray for him and what it means to think about the eventuality of mother. Pray that you would strengthen his faith that he will be able to reach Hong Kong safely to spend perhaps the last moment with his mother. We pray that you would help us to ponder the significance of the life that we have been given and to remind us of even greater urgency to share the gospel with others. We ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, well, we're going to take a look at Matthew 15, the last part now. Okay, we have been reading the Gospel of Matthew. You see, when we talk about Bethel's doctrine, the people say, okay, what is your doctrine all about? Well, I will tell you what our doctrine is. Our doctrine is what we call biblical doctrine. We've got to read the scriptures. We'll point people to the scriptures. So if you disagree with, you disagree with the scriptures. It's not our opinion that we would like to share with you. Right? And we will try to look at it, look at the scriptures. We'll show you the scriptures. We will demonstrate the scriptures. And that is what we're going to try and attempt to do. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ taught, the Scriptures. And we who say we are Christians, we are followers of Christ, must follow in His footsteps too. It must be Christ-centered. We call it Christology. Right? So the Gospel is vital. We have seen Pharisees and scribes misinterpret the Scriptures. They misapply the Scriptures. And so it took the Lord Jesus Christ to say, I, say, I did not come to destroy, but the key word is fulfill. So it has to be Christ-centered. Right? Not man-made doctrines. And that is absolutely vital. And you see this throughout Matthew. It's back at especially chapter 15. And the Lord had to call these people, you are blind leaders, leading the blind. And that can often be very, very painful where people refuse to see. Not that they cannot see, but they refuse to see. And that can happen. What does the Lord Jesus do? Well, He has to carry on because there are others out there that need to hear the gospel. Now, this is where we are, okay? So when we look at what we are ground, this is why we have a Sunday school ministry to teach these things. You know, catechism class is just one part of it. It's, the focus is to help people to be to come to eventual faith, to come to make a decision to whether it's baptism or whether it's membership. But beyond that, you don't end there. We need to continue to learn. Now, this is the book of Acts. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. And the word is doctrine. Where did the apostles get their doctrine from? Same. It has to come from the scriptures. It has to come from the Lord Jesus Christ, these two things. And the challenge is we continue very, very carefully in this. 
right? So we take a look at the study over, over here. Now, let's go back to Matthew 15, and we ask ourselves what the Lord Jesus was teaching here. And he needed to help the disciples very much to find this thing called great faith. Remember, the centurion, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. That was a rebuke to all Israel, to even his disciples. Is there great faith? Now, there was this woman, right? This is our review. There was his ministry outside of Israel in this place called Tyre and Sidon. You wouldn't expect to find a person with great faith there, and yet the Lord had to show them what great faith is. First, you've got to see what it is. You want to, you know, can you want to see? Let me show you what great. Took them outside of Israel. And there was this ministry to uh, the people who were there, and this Canaanite woman and he says, verse 28, the Lord says, O women, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And the daughter was healed that very moment. The disciples were there. They first need to see for themselves. The Lord has to show them. They have to see for themselves what great faith is. What Great faith is not very clear. Just go, go and look at all the scribes and the Pharisees. That is not faith. That is hypocrisy. That is blind leading the blind. They are stubborn like anything. They are closed like anything. They are following the doctrine of man, not of God. And that was a rebuke from the Lord. You want to show, you want to see great faith? Come. Look at this woman, and you don't even think she has because they were going to ask the Lord to ask her to go away. Now, wait a minute. We haven't finished. We're not done here yet. And as the Lord tested her, you watch her response. She is absolutely certain and convinced He is the Son of David. He is the Lord. He can help. And she is not offended by what he says. He be she believes in who he is and what he can do. Great is your faith. See, this is what is needed today too. We need to see, it's so hard to see great faith. We are so used to seeing no faith, weak faith, that we think this is common. This is what faith is, right? In countries, so-called Christian countries, it's called nominal Christians, meaning you are a Christian by name. It's such a common problem today. You, they, they say, what are you, are you, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? They identify as Christian, but they don't really believe in what they say they believe in. They don't practice what they believe in, but they are Christian, whatever that means. They compromise left, right, center, and they say, I'm still Christian. How does that work? You see the problem? It is so common that we think that's what faith is. It isn't. The Lord had to show them this is faith. It's not even translate as great. Now, that's the interesting, the translators translated as great. It, it simply means such faith. This is the kind of faith that we need. But in order to compare and contrast weak faith, little faith, this is such great faith. That is what the Lord Jesus is trying to show His disciples. Right? He has been showing them all this while. 
But see, for them, they are, of course, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Where is great faith? Right there. It is actually right in their face. The Lord Jesus has great faith. But they will be, well, but you are son of God, you are great. Of course, nobody can be. Okay, let me show you in a common woman. Her name is not even mentioned. She's just called a woman from Canaan. A, no, a very common person. She's got great faith. Do you? See, it can be found. It is rare, but it is necessary. This is the kind of faith we need. Right? They are surrounded by the hypocrisy problem. They are surrounded by a legalistic problem. They are surrounded by blind leaders leading the blind. And after a while, they look, either they get very put off and say, I better not to have no faith. Or to follow this kind of faith. Is there a better option? Absolutely. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ came. To show them this is what faith is all about. Okay? We go to the next part of this, and this is important. Right? So this is the context in which we read this. The Lord has to sh see for yourself. And now He is going to show them what great faith can do in His own life. Right? First, we need to see what it is. Now, I show you what it can do. Now, let's take a look at it. And this is now the himself. Right? This is the woman. I want to show you what great faith is. Great faith, I, he has been showing them what great faith is in his own life. They're not seeing it. It shows oh, this woman. This is great faith. Do you understand now? Now, let me show you what great faith can do. What great faith has done for the woman is wonderful. Now, let's see it in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, this is faith in... Did, did Jesus need faith in God? Yes. When He's in the world, every man... How do we relate? By faith. This is by faith. And so he has been teaching people what faith is through his own life all this while, right? Now, let's take a look at verse uh, over, not, not, sorry, not Matthew 29, Matthew 15, verse 29. 15, uh, it's verse 29. And so we see the ministry. Now, this is a, the ministry of the Lord. Look what he, look how he, what, um, what he was able to attempt, right? And verse 29, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, went up on the mountain, sat down there, and then we read, a great multitude came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, many others, and they, sit, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet. And He healed them. And so we read, the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed right, uh, made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now, that is the response of the multitude. Right? They look at that and they, they cannot. It is absolutely amazing, obviously. Okay, now, what, what is this all this about? We've got, say, sometimes we read this and we always think, of course, Jesus can do all these things. He just, you know, so many people came and he just prayed for everybody, everybody got healed. It takes a lot out of a person to care for others. I mean, you ask those who are in healthcare. Wow, if the hospital get over flooded with so many people in need, you, you can have a meltdown. There's just so many needs to attend to. Even if you can help the person, you're going to need a lot of strength 
to go and care for so many. This is called multitude. There's just so many needs. Right? Now, what was the Lord Jesus doing? Now, this is like a summary statement of his ministry. Okay? This is not just here. It is written way back. This is normal for the Lord Jesus to minister like this. Okay? Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Right, right from the beginning part, and we see this. This is what the disciples needed to see. The first thing they did was follow, right? Remember the Lord Jesus Christ said, follow me and I will make you become fishes of men. That's M Matthew 4 verse 19. And then they left all, they followed. They were like his apprentice. They were his disciples. Now, Take a look at the kind of ministry that Jesus was involved with. Verse 23, Matthew 4. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the kingdom of, uh, right, the gospel of the kingdom. So when we read in Matthew 15, he was up on the mountain. What was he doing? He's not sightseeing. He was teaching. He was preaching because you have a big multitude. How do you, you, and you don't have an AVA system. What are you going to do? You need elevation. But this would tell you what he was doing. He wasn't just healing. Part of that would be his ministry because there were so many immediate needs. And he was able to attend to them, and he did. Right now, but this is a glimpse of what he did from the start. Teaching, preaching, first thing, kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. That is first and foremost priority, to help people come to salvation, to help people understand what it, how they can obtain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's called the gospel. Right? This is the spiritual eternal need. The Bible has always been focused on eternity. Solomon understood this. God, you have put eternity in our heart. It's eternity, not... The life on earth is not eternity, obviously. We need an eternal perspective of life. Right? To be prayed for, to be sought, but the Lord certainly had that. The gospel of the kingdom first and foremost to be preached. But look at this. Healing all kinds of sickness, disease among the people. Then his name, right, was now went through all Syria. They brought to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various disease and torment those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics. Now, this give you an example. He healed them. Great multitude followed from Galilee to Decapolis to Jerusalem to Judea beyond the Jordan. This will give you a glimpse of how extensive his ministry is. And in those days, no transportation, no public transport. Where do you, how do you go? You walk. You walk many, many miles. This is what great faith can do. Right? We often look at, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm too old, I, I, don't, I can't, I can't. Yesterday at youth worship, I was teaching the young people from Psalm 18 about David's faith. Well, the first part, statement was his declaration is, I love you, I will love you, O Lord, my rock, my strength, you are my fortress, and so on. So that's called his declaration. But how did he come to have such a passionate faith? Well, he began with how the Lord delivered him, answered his prayer. He was in serious trouble. Fear was there. He almost died, kind of a thing. And he cried out, and the Lord delivered him. Right? Now, faith there, not yet. Faith really came when he asked the Lord to light the lamp of his heart, to come into his life to enlighten his darkness. 
And so when he sees that God is real, God does hear prayers, God can have the power to deliver. It's actually later on where he say the Lord is the one who light the lamp, enlighten my darkness. And then he begins to say, by God, I can. I can run against the troops. I can leap over the wall. In other words, I can do things otherwise I can't. It takes God. And we need the Lord in our lives. So I said to the young people, I'll tell you why you say, oh, I can't. I cannot be committed. I, can, I just don't incline. I'm not. I tell you why. Because you just don't have the Lord in your life. You have Him in your mind. Right? You know the principles that are there. You know what is right. But He hasn't lit your lamp yet. He's not alive. He's not that fire that burns within you. And they know this. Is it not true? You get it, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, David shared his faith. You know how I said, I can? In the past, he can't. And now he says, I can. By God, I can. With God, I can. But that's what faith is. You see the power of the Lord and what God can do. He can make the blind see. How many doctors are there today who could do that? The one thing I remember Auntie Kath was most afraid of was his, her blindness. Say, if I'm blind, you know, I, you know, God, please take me home because I can't live anymore. I can't hear. If my blindness, if my sight goes, I'm gone. The doctor can do all they can to try and prevent, to try and minimize, to try and prolong, but no doctor can heal the blind. You're blind, you're gone. No doctor can make the lame walk. Certainly no doctor can do anything about demon possession. This is the power that is from God. You see, it's not just words. Receiving the Lord into our life is like Him lighting the lamp inside us. And the darkness will go. What comes is power. What comes is light from the Lord. This is actually what faith is. This is the kind. It's not just talking about, well, but this person has great faith. I just have normal faith. In the eyes of the Lord, there's no such thing. You made that up. There's either great faith or there's very little faith that is no good for anything. What do you want? What do you really want? A faith that really works requires God inside us, working. He will light your lamp. He will enlighten your darkness. He will empower that life. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that example. How was He able to attempt so many things? How was He able to care for so many people? And they marvel. See, this is what the disciples was to see. You can do this. Right? So I, I have the Bible memory verse that Bethany gave out. And I, I put it at my front door. And I take one and I put, each day I remind myself a promise that is from God. So during the week, one was, again, I am reminded, is what, who Jesus is. He says, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. That is the promise of the Lord. And I am reminded, it is the Lord that builds His church. Reminded, don't, don't be afraid, don't worry. Right? I shared with the seniors, it, this is David's faith. If the Lord was not on our side, you know, he talks about, if the Lord is not on our side, we would be in serious trouble. You don't worry. All you need is the Lord on your side. 
He will build the church. Do I get worried? Yeah, sometimes I do. From time to time, I do. I look at the strength of the church. <sighs> I look at the whole the list of people going for family camp. How many people can, is able to serve the Lord in this area? A handful. Maybe five. Wow, we need the Lord to build His church. How many will be able to, to teach? How, may be, how many will be able to run children's program? Very little. Right? That, that's, I'm just sharing with you the reality. And I'm reminded, Lord, you said you will build the church. Please build your church. Right? And then the next day, the Bible verse talks about how the Lord Jesus Christ said, greater works you will do because I go to the Father. Ah, greater works. You look, remember, this is the disciples. They have seen the works that Jesus did. No wonder they struggled with this. And the Lord says, greater works you will do. What I have covered is just this small area. One day you will reach the world. Would you be able to believe that? It takes faith. This is what we need. How would we live our life? One day we will all die. Might as well spell it out for everybody. How do we want to live this life? It's eventual. Nothing is forever. So Matt, Matt drove in and saw, you know, our... Did you notice when we drove in, yeah, that you, we have a big mirror that helps us look at, see the oncoming traffic around the corner? So he said, I drove in and the thing was on the ground, shattered. It's gone. Well, we, we wanted to live forever. It doesn't live forever. Nothing lives forever. We don't live forever. But while we are alive, while we still can, where we are not told we only have a few months to live, how will we live? Right? Uncle Clive told me, you know, this, this is, it took this to really, really make it clear I'm living on borrowed time. Really living on borrowed time. You've got no time. Every moment counts. Every minute counts. Suddenly, what is really, really important? Well, these are lessons for Him to teach us. But we've got to learn all these things too, for ourselves. This was what the Lord Jesus was very conscious of. We don't like to see this. We don't like, uh, we, we, we have a law, we've got this, we've got that. And we tell ourselves we can't. We can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do the other thing. Well, the Lord had to show the disciples what they can and what they must do. This is faith. Remember, as we progress in the chapters, now we're chapter 15. By now, see, it gets more and more. Remember what he says, you know, by now you should understand. You don't understand. See, that's the problem. Time is going, passing them by. By now, they should understand, and they still don't. In chapter 4, they don't understand. Okay, all right, they're still new to this. But now we are chapter 15. This is called a repeated lesson. Right? They, let's take a look at this idea of repeated lesson. And sometimes, the Lord has to repeat these lessons again and again and again. Let, let, let's take a look at this. In chapter 15, we go on further, right? We see how the Lord did what He did. Now, verse 32, the Jesus called His disciples to Himself, right? He calls them to Himself. Now, there are things to learn from this, obviously. It was not just to say, okay, Jesus went about healing and did this and did this. Matthew wrote this with great intention. If he wanted to summarize, he should have, could have just done it in chapter four, 4 and be done with it. Why bring it up again? It's basically the same thing. Why bring it up again? Why are lessons brought up again? Because you, you need remedial classes. 
right? You're not learning the right lessons. And so did this Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the multitude. You see, what is missing in a lot of time? Why is there no greater faith that we should have? We've not cultivated this thing called compassion. And the Lord has to tell them, I tell you, I have compassion on the multitude because they have continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. You know that they, have, they are with you. They have been there with us. They want to come. They want to learn. Three days and they have gone with well, very little food now. And I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. This is really needed. This thing called compassion. Right? And the Lord has to say these things. Then his disciples said to him, But where do we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Are you looking at this? Is this familiar text? Is, sometimes you go through, like, is this not deja vu? This just happened in chapter 14, right? And the Lord said, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fishes. And then he commanded the multitude, sit down on the ground he took seven loaves, there the fish, gave thanks, broke them, gave it to his... This is like repeating the same thing. Right? And then, now, he gave, they gave it to the multitude, they all ate, they were filled, they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left, and then all those who ate were 4,000 men besides, men, uh, besides women and children. And then he sent them, the multitude, away. This is the lesson. This was done in chapter 14. Isn't it? He has fed the multitude. He has done this before. Right? This is chapter 14. Well, go back to chapter 14. Maybe we also forgot. This is like, they either had dementia, they cannot remember, what they saw, or what they have heard, right? Remember chapter 14, they were told again, right? Well, how come? It's already late. Send them away, verse 15. And the Lord says, you give them something to eat. And then, uh, we only have five loaves. They have only got five and two fish. And then the Lord says, bring them to me. And the Lord fed 5,000 from that incident. This time round, 4,000. 5,000, 4,000. Besides men and I mean, besides the children and women, meaning to say they could have been at least over 10,000. You can have miracle, power, provision, seen again. What are you learning? And the scariest thing is you learn absolutely nothing. And there was the Lord Jesus Christ there himself. To me, that is absolutely frightening. It really is frightening. I, this is a repeated lesson. And they seem to have totally forgotten what the Lord did. There they were again afraid. There they were again looking within their own resources, but we don't have enough. But we all don't have enough. We always do that. We just say we don't have enough. How can we care for others if we cannot care for ourselves? We just don't have enough. Incident, that's 5,000. 
Here is 4,000. You add the figures to that. How is it even possible? Compassion missing. Great faith totally missing. This was the problem. And this is a problem still today. And so we have so-called Christians not living by faith. They live by their wits. They live by the worries. Same lessons the Lord Jesus Christ taught. Why do you worry, Matthew 6? You worry about this, what you can eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to do, what you're going to do. And the worries of life consumes you. It saps all the energy away. I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm going, and you, what do you end up with life? Just a lot of regrets. I wish I could have done this, I wish I could have, what for? Why live with regret? That is a painful reality a lot of the time. Right? And so when we read it, this is side by side, Matthew 14, feeding of 5,000. Matthew 15, 4,000. And it's just nothing there. He has to bring them out to show them, this woman has great faith. He never said that to his disciples because it was so obvious they did not have great faith. And they were the ones following him. They were the ones seeing all the miracles. They were the ones who have the greatest teacher teaching them. What is missing? We almost always ask, what is missing? Is it because the teacher didn't teach? Nope. Is it because the Lord has not done his part? Nope. And yet, this is the problem. All right? Well, these are important lessons for all of us to learn if we look at it. Right? They had to learn the same lesson again. Compassion. Where is the compassion? Look at the compassion of the Lord Jesus. It drives Him to care for the people. Is there compassion? That is something that we all need to find. That is something that we must seek the Lord for. Well, the other thing, compassion and great faith together. These two must go together. Not one without the other. This is what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is compassion, but there is also great faith in God to provide, to bless, to enable, to minister to so many people. There are so many needs out there. And yet, so many are left unattended. It's how, what the Lord Jesus Christ described the multitude. They are like sheep scattered without shepherd, weary. See, this is our call to respond. To respond to reaching out and find, we need to find that compassion. We need to find such faith in God if we could reach out to many more people. Right? So remember we had a person called David Wild come and worship with us a year, few years ago now. And he's passed on. Right? And now the, the pastor, he's, he actually is a pastor. His name, uh, you know, he works there in Brightwater and he called up he, and he asked, Pastor Chris, can you take care of another lady? She's from Papua New Guinea. She's only 50 years old, um, but had a stroke. And she's a Christian, and she would like to come to church. And he said, straight away, I recommend Bethel. Because we know how you care for people. How you were there to care for David. How you were there at the church, of course, to care for, uh, you know, even to the funeral, to the last moment. Could you look after this lady? So, uh, well, we're going to do that. 
Uh, Christine, uh, Christine Chong is uh, being tasked to pick her up and uh, bring her to, because she can't, after the stroke, you can't walk very far. So we went to visit her, introduce ourselves to her. I, um, and she's a very delightful lady. Shared straight away, very open, shared a little bit about how she came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, she says, I'm a Catholic, brought up. My, fa- my, my husband was a Lutheran. And she tells me, she knows I'm a pastor, she says, you know, right, Lutheran and Catholic don't get along. <laughs> she tells me that. I just smile. And he says, so one of us decided to go to a Christian church to start over, to, have, to find an uh, equal, equal ground somewhere. And as, say, as I heard the gospel open up about who Jesus is, about the salvation he offers, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus. He says, that's when I became a real believer. And she says, I just want to be, you know, come to church, and that's where I am. So we're very happy to pick her up later on and, and come worship with us. So if you see a lady uh, from Papua New Guinea, she's our new friend, uh, Louise is her name. Right? And she would like to stay uh, for lunch. We, we tell her, we, we don't know what food you eat, but we eat Chinese food. We mainly, a lot of predominantly. She says, no problem. I just don't eat cucumbers. Oh, broccoli, sorry, broccoli. So, okay, uh, noted. Good thing Christine is part of the kitchen team. Please take note, broccoli. Uh, we won't feed her broccoli. How? This is our way of practicing compassion. This is what we are trying to do here at Bethel. Have we mastered it? No. But we're trying. We try a bit more compassion to reach out. And as we do, the Lord will send others. He is the one. Remember, He builds the church. When you're not ready, He won't. The test will come. Will you care for our people? And when you can, he will bring to. Because they are his to be cared for. They are his sheep, not ours. We're caretakers. That's our challenge. With compassion, with faith, let's care for people. Let's be God's kind of church. Where people will care for people. Because our own hearts and lives have been greatly touched by God. Right? The next two months, our theme will be on the, on the love of God. And it is a deeply, deeply moving theme to consider all over again. Okay? Well, questions you want to raise up, go ahead. You can ask anything you, you wish to ask and, and all this. Okay? But to help you not just read a portion, but always connect back. When you read, bear in mind what you have read. Then you will see a fuller picture of of why Matthew wrote what he did, of what the Lord Jesus Christ, I always do that, right? So you put things side by side. What are the lessons? Why put it together like this? The two feeding of 5,000, 4,000 next to each other. There is a repeat of his ministry. What does that mean? Okay, go back to Matthew 4. You, You just have to look at things like that. And when you can look at it and begin to appreciate where Matthew is coming from, your own heart will be instructed and encouraged by the Lord's Word. Okay? This is reading it and then say, well, Lord, what is it that he was saying? No, remember, he is very conscious of his own death. There is much he needs to not only do, but to impart to his disciples. They are living on borrowed time. All right? He has to show them, he has to live out his own faith, He needs them to learn what great faith is and what great faith can do. That's the challenge for all of us. We've got to see it for ourselves. Rather than to look at what is common and what is just all around, look to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what faith is. Look to what he points out as great faith. Centurion, a woman of Canaan, this is great faith. Look at that. 
and then look to the Lord again. This is what faith, great faith can do. Not just to care for your own family. You go beyond. You really go beyond. And it is going to take compassion and great faith to, to do that. Okay, right. any questions you want to raise up and, and ask? Be happy to uh, answer, to address. Any, any of the questions you want to uh, uh, point out or anything that will aid our learning further, that could encourage us further, your observations, your, your own reading of Matthew, as you read Matthew like this, it, it's patiently, bit by bit. Okay, go, go ahead, Josh. Um, Pastor yeah. Chris, um, yeah. I was ask, how do we um, uh, mix compassion and faith together? Yeah, good. All right. We, yeah, how do we mix it? Yeah. That's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer to that one. I really do. But, you see, it's one of those things that is very hard to teach. You must catch it and be moved to acquire it. Right? It, it really is. For, well, let's start with compassion. I, I look at John and Bev, and Bev cel celebrates 83 years. Uh, not, not, we're going to celebrate Bev's uh, birthday today, but uh, her actual birthday is in uh, this coming week. I look at them, and they will call up. And you know, we know that what they're going through, and they both had stroke before. They're both stroke patients, by the way. And they both fight cancer. Is 80 plus. What do you do with your life? Do you spend the whole day moping and groaning? Not a chance. He would drag John to go to this place, this place, this place, to go and visit calls, to visit, and she would tell me her day. How do you attempt these things? She's starting her own breakfast program. You see, you know, we, she would tell me, you know, somebody gave me this love gift. And wow, this is a very wonderful love gift. Now, they have their own needs. And she says, Lord, what do you want me to do with this love gift? Okay, I am going to do a breakfast program. <sighs> That's compassion. I am really deeply moved by her heart of compassion for the less fortunate, to those who, are in particular, she has a heart for those who are elderly and in hospital. Elderly and in hospital. She's elderly to me. And she, is, she will call up airlines. I say, you serious? You call up the airlines? I say, yes, because I know that they, they have these special bags, uh, you know, like, like bags that they put the overhead, right? That would be rather to let the people carry plastic bags into hospitals, no dignity. We're going to ask, can you give us these bags and we put in you know, basic hygiene things because there's a lot of people who just don't have people care for them, especially the elderly. And they gave it to her. She will go to places and she says, there's so many people that will just offer these things here, show kindness here, she says, I'm just meet, met with so much kindness. This is called principle. Right? We were reading this in Matthew 18. With the merciful, God will show himself merciful. With the blameless, God will show himself blameless. With the pure, God will show himself pure. That's called principle of life that God works with all the time. Jesus taught this. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. That's called compassion. That's called faith. She says, I thanks, thank God. I pray, Lord, these are our needs. We need to care for this many people. This many. You, your husband, is, he, he is just, any chance he gets to talk is not about himself. It's not about pity that he wants. He wants to talk about the Lord. So I am greatly floored and humbled when they come for the Bible reading club. You should be at home resting. I just want to learn. What, how do you feed that, 
on this compassion and this faith? Where is your food source? The Word of God. Josh, I don't know how it works. I really don't. I just see it. I just see that it does work. That God gives compassion. Yeah. Obedience to Well, that's a separate thing. Of course, there are many things. The, we will be speaking about this later on, the Lord Jesus' obedience to God and what that is. And it's a beautiful form of obedience. Right? Because obedience to God can be you grudgingly obey or like the Lord Jesus Christ in how He obeyed with deep love for the Father. No problem. But these, in this lesson today, these are the things that is needed for one is compassion, the other is great faith. And that's true. There are many other factors, but these things really stand out. And what the disciples need to make a difference in many lives. And so Bev would tell me, I have prepared 80 breakfast, program, you know, breakfast hampers to be given to the hopeless. And, and this is not just... Uh, Homeless all over. The, the, the homeless is, is plentiful. But it's very specific. She, look, she's reaching out to those who are elderly in particular. They are, have either been neglected or, or there's just nobody caring for them. And she tells herself, 80 is really not enough. Right? So she tells me about her day and I'm just, I'm literally floored. She, I, I, she tells me, I'm very grateful for the service that they get because uh, CAF had this too. When you know, they, they'll send people to come help you clean, they help you do grocery, they, 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 they help you with the household things, right? And so they come and they say, what is all these things here? And she tells them, I'm actually putting these hampers together for uh, people. And she will ask, do you want to help? And these are young girls, young, well, young as in, you know, they are 18, 20, and they come and they help her. And she said, Chris, can I tell you, this week, one of the girls came back on her off day. Off day, she's not working. She called up and says, this is my off day, but can I come and help you finish up all those things? It's not because you're paying me. It's because I am so deeply moved. Josh, this is why Jesus did what... You can't teach compassion, unfortunately. But you can show it. You can show it. And people can catch on. That's what it is. That's what it really is. That's what Bev and John has been doing all this while. And to me, it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Right? So Eldine says, can we bake them a cake? I said, oh, absolutely, bake them a beautiful cake. Well, these are wonderful servants of God too. 83 years old, with all the struggles in life, and there's compassion and faith of this kind. This is moving. See, God has even send someone over for us to see. It's a question of whether we're seeing anything. Right? That's what, how the Lord was helping us too. And my personal challenge is to always see, Lord, what is it that you show us? What is it that we are learning here? Let me follow Christ. That's the challenge. His word is always backed up with reality. Right? I hope that answers the question. <laughs> right? It really is. It's, it, can, I, can, I, can I teach you this? Very hard. We will show you this. That's how Jesus did it. He showed them what compassion is. Imagine so many people coming. See, after a while, doctors, they, they, this compassion is no more. They look at the patient, they, they tell you, okay, this is what you have. And you have six months. Next is desensitized. You can't, because if they, 
it's, it's hard. Imagine a person, a work person, a healer, a therapist who has compassion like the Lord Jesus. He didn't just heal people. He would have spent time talking to them, getting to know them, caring for them, relating with them, restoring them, sharing with them further about what the kingdom is. It takes a lot. Is it worth it? It's going to take compassion and great faith. And so we try to do in our small way, whatever we can. Start small. Can more add it to you as your faith grows? Is more added to you? That's our challenge. Okay. Well, any other questions you want to raise up? Well, appreciate the question. It's a good question. A very, very good question. So all, we all need this too. Right? From, from anyone else? If not, we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the Scriptures. We thank you that we could read it. And we pray that you would open our understanding to receive these words to our own heart. We thank you above all, the Lord Jesus and his example of what it means to have faith. Pray that you would help us to open our heart to receiving the Lord into our own life, that He will light our lamp, enlighten our darkness, that we too, by faith in You, able to do more than we think we actually can. We ask that You would inspire and challenge us to share the gospel, to live out the gospel, to practice the gospel in our own lives that others may be also pointed to the Lord Jesus himself. We ask for your blessings in Jesus' name.